the outbreak of the novel coronavirus has had a tremendous impact on the mental health of people worldwide. Huge topic, of course. This panel discusses the aftermath of the pandemic on people's mental health and deliberates on solutions to this unprecedented crisis. Please join me in welcoming our session moderator, Mr. Aaron Huey, founder and president of the Fire Mountain Residential Treatment Center to take the proceedings ahead. Come on up. Thank you. My name is Aaron Huey, and in 2009, I founded a residential treatment center for adolescents ages 12 to 17. We have never, ever been as busy as we are now. So much so that on the side, as a side gig, knowing that we're now in the gig culture, I have opened my private coaching practice up again. And within one week, I had 15 clients. Within two weeks, I was handing clients to other therapists who are completely booked. We are seeing, to use the overused phrase, unprecedented times, and we have to talk about mental health. To do this with me, I would like to bring up my guests. Dr. Kenneth Figman. Nicole Dare. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much. Melissa Milinak. Thank you, Doctor. Jordana Latosas. Did I say that right? Thank you. And Tanya Fashnot. Did I say the last name right? Jolliff is my last name. Jolliff. <laughs> it's okay. Nice. Thank you. Oh, we don't need it, I think. We're all might. So to begin the conversation, we're looking at systemic failure internally. There's not a person on the planet that didn't have the experience of having safety removed. When the people you love, the air you breathe, can suddenly kill you, where are you safe, truly? Externally, the education system, the healthcare system, and the political system all looked to seem to fail us. Unknown whether it will happen again or not, but it seems we must plan on it. And there is the overlying question of what's the difference between an ounce of prevention and the pound of cure when we're dealing with a pandemic? Before we get into the questions, I would love it for each of you to say a little bit, take about a minute to talk about who you are and what you do. We'll just start with you, Dr. Sure, well, it's an honor and a pleasure, a treat and a treasure to join each of you today. My name is Dr. Kinette Thigpen, also known as Dr. K. I am the CEO of Well Trust Partners, where I help companies who are committed to going beyond checking the box of mental well-being programs. So, glad to be here. Thank you. My name is Nicole Daher. I am founder and CEO of Success on the Spectrum. It is the only center-based ABA treatment franchise for children with autism in the country. The number of children being diagnosed with autism is growing exponentially and the number of providers available have not kept up. So it is my goal and my company's goal to provide access of care to the children that need it across the country. That's amazing. Thank you. And I'm Dr. Melissa Milanic. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina. Founded Mind Impact Consulting a number of years ago to do executive coaching and speaking and training around the world to help individuals better understand sleep and anxiety for optimal performance. And now with the pandemic, working with Invista Insights to really dive into workplace well-being to help organizations better understand their culture, their employees, and recognizing that the world doesn't end when you walk through that door at work, but truly what are all the full components for a comprehensive individual to really be able to help improve well-being across the lifespan. Hello, my name is Jordana Latozas. I am the CEO and president of the Recovery Mobile Clinic. It is a startup, fully mobile model of addiction medicine practicing in Michigan. So what uh, my background is in pain management and uh, integrative health, but also addiction medicine, obviously, trying to increase the access to medicated assisted treatment in the community because this is the highest hit population, especially with the COVID uh, pandemic. Thank you. 
And I'm Tanya Jolliffe. Uh, I'm the founder of LIT Wellness Solutions. We're an integrative health and wellness uh, company that focuses on helping people, uh, families, and businesses understand the creation of a culture of wellness, that we are multidimensional beings, and we seem to only look at two or three of those dimensions, and we need to be looking at all of the dimensions to understand how they all interact together. And that's our goal and our focus. Please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. And as I said, my name is Aaron Huey. I am the founder of Fire Mountain Residential Treatment Center. I'm also the host of the number one parenting podcast, Beyond Risk and Back. I truly believe in shameless self-promotion, <laughs> and you'll all be saying it in your sleep. Let's get to our questions. First, wanting to point out an obvious thing that is taking place on this stage. The comfort we have with women talking about mental health and the discomfort we may have with men being able to discuss the issues of emotion needs to change. But we have the intellect and the know-how up here. Let's ask them the questions. My, my first question is, what are the biggest impacts that COVID-19 has had on the mental health from your perspective of the mental health industry? And anyone may take the question to begin. If you don't mind, I'll start with that one. Please do. With the addiction population, these are people who are suffering from opiate addiction or alcohol addiction or stimulant addiction. The pandemic did an unprecedented amount of damage to that population. We had been seeing improvements over the last five years. And in one year, we completely undid all of the progress that we had actually been establishing. What the pandemic did is took away in one day every social support, every you know, pr uh, practitioner, every medication assisted treatment, every social support that they had. And then it took away their routine. And then it took away the ability to kind of network and communicate with family members that the supportive people in their lives that were helping them progress. And then it just, gave them money in their, in their bank account with no direction on what to do with it. We saw a 30% increase in overdoses. It, people are dying as a result of this, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the results of what society did to it. My company being a mobile medical clinic never stopped. We had to pivot, obviously, like everybody else did with COVID-19, but we were out in the front lines in the shelters doing COVID tests so that shelters could actually still put people in the shelters during COVID-19. It was March, April, Michigan's cold, and the shelters just kicked them out. Where do these guys go? So we had to do COVID testing in order to keep the shelters open to keep people having a roof over their head, nevertheless mind their addiction treatments and their supportive systems. You know, it was what we saw in this population was an overwhelming amount of helplessness and panic and fear, and it just fueled the, the demons that they're already dealing with on a daily basis. Yeah, I would say, you know, being a corporate mental health consultant and speaker, um, one quote comes to mind for me, and that is, mental health needs more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversations. And so ultimately what that means is the impact actually brought more awareness to individuals and especially corporations that something needs to be done. We need to be doing something. And so what I really see and what I've been focused on is it's become our duty to care to really talk about mental health in the workplace where previously when we talk about the duty to care, it's been more about the physical and the medical side, keeping our employees safe. But what's really important is that health is inclusive of mental health and we can't forget that. And oftentimes what we hear people say is like, well, how will I know? Like, how do I know which employees will need help versus what ones don't? And I think this is one time where we can use the word assume. Because when we hear the word assume, we know typically what that means. But in this situation, when it comes to the duty to care for mental health in the workplace, you have to assume that everyone is at risk. Especially being that one in five people self-report having a mental health condition. Now note it, that one in five that's reported by the CDC and World Health Organization, that was pre-pandemic, so that's like 2017 numbers. 
Now, of course, we go through the pandemic, we have the political climate that we went through, and we have the social injustice that we experienced and the racial trauma. So when you add all that together, not to mention the normal everyday stressors that we experience that I think that organizations and corporations have forgotten about, we have, I think that one in five, those numbers should actually be a lot higher. So I think eventually we're going to see what those new numbers are. So I think when you talk about the impact, it's really about mental health needing more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversations. Doctor, one of the things you just said that's very interesting is that I, 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 we, we constantly talk to people about looking at the ACE quiz, the Adverse Childhood Experiences quiz. There's not a question on that quiz about global pandemic, but knowing the, the effects that we're all going through, it should be. And that gives everybody in the world a point on that quiz. And we know that once you hit the number three, you're at risk. Absolutely, agree with you. Who else has a comment on this question? So one thing I wanted to say to that as well is, as you're talking about higher numbers, what we know within the corporate and executive space, and again, pre-pandemic, is that eight out of 10 employees will never seek help out of fear and shame. So over 80% of individuals that need it, even if there is an EAP program, even if there are checking some boxes and programs that were offered. And so there is nothing normal about what's been going on. We know that the social support pieces, the individual employee spends over 90,000 hours of their life with their coworkers, with their, but now all of a sudden there was this isolation that was happening. And even from a supervisor support standpoint and a communication standpoint, how, Zoom fatigue is a real thing, right? We talk about all these other aspects where there's just general stresses and the majority of the population, was, we already function in this place of stress. It's that badge of honor of who shows up first and who stays the longest. And we think I, from a sleep standpoint, you snooze, you lose, and the least sleep you get, that means that you're dedicated more. Well, now we see that in Instead of about 10% of the population having insomnia and stress issues, now we're seeing two-thirds reporting these difficulties. We saw an increase of 20 to 40% as they were talking about with depression, but even resources are being cut because funding is being cut, and so we're having less access, less of that support. We're not even having the social support that we were having before. People are turning to unhealthy coping strategies because they don't really know what to use for it, and we're now seeing 80 to 90% of individuals not wanting to get help because there's more of that fear and shame. So I'm hoping that from the pandemic and more people at least recognizing this is happening, that it will encourage those conversations. It's amazing how much just saying, how are you doing? But not it just being a check box of, oh, I asked the question, what's the next thing? And finding that right balance. I'm hoping that, that one of the positive impacts is starting to have that conversation. What about things that we don't currently see as effects and fallout from the COVID-19 experience that you personally think we're going to see? What's coming that hasn't emerged yet? I have a different completely um, demographic than these ladies here. I serve children. And children with autism often have comorbidities like anxiety and depression. Um, that we see they struggle with transition. They generally have a lot of social deficits. And when you take them out of a clinic like mine that is trying to have positive association with social interaction and you allow them to be isolated and then you interrupt their routines and they have these additional stressors of not having, you know, for these kids, they have a lot of texture issues. They couldn't get the right brand of chicken nugget and these kids were just going ham on their parents it not only affects the children, which we expected. We expected regression from our clients, but what we didn't anticipate, like you said, was the effect it had on the parents and their own mental health. Because now they are trapped in this home with no body that can babysit their child, no one that can come over. They get zero break. And these kids are very hyperactive. They're not getting sleep. The kids have insomnia. Their routines are broken. They're not eating right because they don't have their typical foods. It's so hard to get foods. And these parents had so much stress on them and no reprieve that we saw an increase in abuse to their own children. Whether they meant it or not, it happened. And it's going to continue to happen until we get back into that routine and help the parents as well. That increase of abuse is something that was very heavily reported at the beginning of C-19, that the domestic violence rates were going through the roof, and then that all of a sudden got swept under the rug and we didn't hear about it. What else? What else are we going to see that we may not be seeing right now? One of the things as a registered dietitian, you know, if 
you tried to buy any yeast, you found you couldn't find yeast anywhere because everybody was making sourdough bread. And it became the thing to do in the beginning to make bread. And comfort foods became, you, you couldn't get food, so you got whatever comfort foods you could get. And so it brought out disordered eating uh, for a lot of people. But the flip side of that that we're not going to recognize in the moving forward is um, gut health got dramatically changed. Uh, gut flora got dramatically changed. And that affects anxiety. That affects stress. And getting things back in balance, um, there's still a lot of fear about going to the grocery store and about going to get certain foods. There's a lot of fear still about, can I go out? Is it safe to go out? Should I wear a mask? Shouldn't I wear a mask? And so just going out, it's like, let me just stay home and do my thing. And we're going to see more of that anxiety and uh, disorder moving forward as they move back in. And some of it is related to that gut-brain connection and that it's all thrown off. And we need to be paying attention to that. And I would just kind of add, you know, definitely we're going to see more anxiety, but I think in particular post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. um, or post-COVID stress disorder, which we haven't really talked and touched much on. But I think, you know, of course, the world's opening back up. You know, we've got vaccinated and we're kind of like, woohoo, like, all right, nothing happened. Let's back to business as usual. But we haven't even begun to see the impact. Like, we're about to embark on a tsunami of mental health challenges um, from anxiety and depression, which, of course, are the number one and number two mental illnesses. Um, but we can't forget about that post, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think the other piece, too, that I think that we're not necessarily ready or haven't really thought about is when we look at the corporate settings, we have put extraordinary demands on our leaders. From the time that we have pivoted and asking more of them of how to manage in this remote environment, especially for companies who maybe have not managed in remote settings before, and now we're saying, okay, now this mental health thing is here. We, we're wanting to implement well-being initiatives. Now we want you to be able to recognize and respond. And so, yes, do they need to be able to understand, recognize, and respond? Absolutely. Do employees need to be aware so that they can take action? Absolutely. But at the same time, we can't forget about our managers because we are continuing to put more demands on them. Well, I was just going to say the other side of that is there has to be trust within the workplace. You can provide all those programs that you want, and you can encourage them all you want, but if they don't trust, if the employee doesn't trust that it's not going to come back on them as a, a, well, they're not mentally well, they're emotionally unstable, those kind of labels, even in, in jest, they affect your forward movement, they affect your, you know, your willingness to take advantage of the very services that your company is providing. And when you look at the statistics about the use rate, well, trust and manager and management trust among employees, and well, they all go together. You can't separate those out. And so we have to look at that side of it too. It definitely speaks to you know creating psych psychologically safe work environments where you're speaking to the trust, the belonging, the inclusion, where everybody's really moving and focused towards. So absolutely, creating those psychologically safe environments where people feel that they can trust, they, they, they don't feel like, oh, because I say something, now I'm weak. Now I may not be in line for that next promotion and all the other narratives that we begin to tell ourselves. The Along those lines, too, with some of the work that we've been doing, so with Invista, we specifically go into businesses and we're doing deeper dive assessments to look at all the aspects of well-being. And what we're finding is that organizations used to just measure engagement. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my employees are engaged. They're engaged. This is great. They like their, their supervisor. They like what they're doing. But what research is showing us is that the most engaged employees are actually at the highest risk of burnout. Right. So to your point, the, the leaders that have been in there and that did not want to take a day off, look at your folks in a lot of nonprofits who were working with food banks, for instance, and saying, okay, well, I know I'm supposed to take this day to decompress, but if I don't take that day off, someone else doesn't eat, and I took this job because I care about what I'm doing. We're seeing this a lot with our health care providers and our care team members, and we don't want to take a day off because we want to make sure that we're taking care of people. And so as much as we see that engagement continue to grow, that's actually leading more to burnout and then to turnover into a lot of these other aspects as well that are going to have that significant fallout impact make a comment too and it, I know I'm kind of a little of an outlier as an addiction medicine practitioner but the amount of alcoholism that we've seen escalate during the pandemic from a lot of the people working at home from moms that all of a sudden went from a corporate environment with being a stay-at-home mom and a full-time teacher for four kids you know for like you mentioned you know dealing with a child with disabilities with no support system 
And we all made jokes about it. You know, how many, you know, Facebook feeds did you see about, yep, this coffee in the coffee cup? You know, we all joked about it. Unfortunately, our society is an alcohol-based society. And what I'm seeing through our clinic is mothers and fathers and people who n never struggled with alcoholism before coming to me and saying, I need help. I'm drinking a half a bottle of wine a day. And my doctor said it's not a problem. It is a problem, and we do have to recognize and be comfortable as healthcare providers, as employers, as parents, as teachers, recognizing what transition has actually happened here. The alcoholism spike in the United States it was astronomical over the pandemic, and we're going to see retribution from that for a while. I mean, I read a statistic that online alcohol sales increased 300% in the first six months you know, of the pandemic. And when we're not willing to recognize and help and actually <clears throat> speak up, then what we're going to start seeing is some of these stressors and depression and anxiety starts to have another fueler. And then now we're out of control. Now we have a population that has an alcohol addiction issue. And that's just a, another role to kind of piggyback on every other topic we've been talking and about. And this is just the first pandemic. It will not be the last. It's going to happen again and again. And if these things sequentially happen very close together, we can't get ahead of this problem. It's just going to snowball. Mm -hmm. Let's use that to jump into the next question as I'm jumping around here and listening to you talk and putting in more questions as we're <laughs> revealing what actually has not been discussed is, okay, so if this isn't the last one, what do we need to put in place now for the next one that, that would help stave off some of this, that would help ease the, the pain of the next experience? We're already yes. fatigued, at so the, what next? At the very top, we need a little more governmental support and I know that's like a big hot issue, um, but for a for at least my industry, um, we were considered we're mental health providers, but we're not doctors. We're specialists, but not doctors. And when the shut the shutdown, the lockdown happened, um, my husband, who's a physician, was able to get supplies like masks and gloves and hand sanitizers from the city. He got that assistance, and he was able to keep his practice open, but. My practice wasn't qualified for that because we're not doctors. And even though we are an essential healthcare service, if I was not able to borrow from him or find some sort of hidden stash somewhere, I would have had to shut down my doors. And we were lucky that I found enough to stay open. But this has to, there has to be exceptions, right? And I know that not everybody can stay open and the government can't have everything on its shoulders. But we were kind of, the mental health industry, the behavior health industry was kind of forgotten. It was pushed back to second to the people with medical issues. Like you were saying before, it's just as important. Absolutely. But just because you're not bleeding, you don't get that help. And that needs to change. From a small nonprofit standpoint, um, operating as a startup and as a mobile model and as a nonprofit, kind of was like the trifecta. Trying to get funding to try to stay open, to kind of be out there and seeing patients was almost impossible. You know, trying to write grants to apply and, and compete against, you know, large hospital systems and everything. It's, you know, it, it was very challenging to try to get staff to work with me because of, you know, the pandemic. You know, there's people who are, were scared of exposing themselves or, you know, having people come in and, and test. It was, it's just a whole mess, but I guess my main point here is funding opportunities have to be more widespread, and they can't, all, all of the money can't go straight to the state, or all the money can't go straight to the large healthcare, you know, facilities. It has to focus on a little more of the community health basis. That's where the people are, but getting community health funding is very difficult. There's, it's yeah. such a, it's such a unique experience. Um, we, we went above and beyond all of the uh, uh, rules and regulations about preventative, wearing masks, wearing gloves at our facility. We caught a lot of feedback. Um, but our, our stance was, these aren't our children. We have to wear masks. We have to protect other people's children. Now, a year and a half plus later, my, my team, my staff is still wearing masks. These are kids with developmental issues. And as we all know, we develop human connection through understanding body language. But here we are covering an extremely important part of our communication connection piece. 
On the flip side, when I teach martial arts to the kids, I take my mask off. I need them to see my face during this experience. So we catch flack for that on this side. Yesterday on the plane as I'm flying here, a little baby is making eye contact with me and under my mask, I'm smiling. Mm -hmm. But I'm not getting that limbic resonance from the child because the child is not connected. So one of the problems that I'm seeing that needs to prevent it is how do we maintain connection through separation? So that's my two bit in there. Anybody else have anything about preventative? Yeah, I will just add, I think, you know, the biggest thing when it comes to mental health is we're very reactive. So it's like now that we're in this problem and we're having these challenges, now let's do something. However, we need to completely change our, our mindset to say, let's move more towards prevention. Like, how do we prevent this? So I agree, we need funding, we need legislation, we need all that great stuff. But in doing so, we need to talk about prevention so we can ultimately prevent what's happening. Crisis preparation is key for any business mm -hmm. and it's really hard to anticipate things that never happened before or that they say you're protected from. Absolutely. So we have an industry where as a system we saw systemic failure. Not, not just on the physical side, as a facility, I had to fight for my masks. I had to fight for these types of things as well, even though we're a healthcare facility. On, uh, on top of that, hiring during the time. I had, had older people retire from my company, had newer people come and apply, but then not take the job just so they could prove and maintain their unemployment status. Yeah. So we're already dealing with a taxed industry, and we're all talking about how to try to squeeze more from an industry that is already pressing its edges. How do we squeeze more from an industry that's already struggling? What's our solutions? One thing is creating the solutions, and that's what my company is kind of focused on, is creating the solutions that allow other companies and businesses to utilize them. Lifestyle wellness promotion, for instance. Um, teaching families how to assess their own lifestyle wellness and being able to then identify where their strengths are as a family unit or an individual and where their weaknesses are and what, what are the things that I need to be paying attention to. To just say I have anxiety but not being able to identify where that anxiety even originates from, we need to be able to put the tools in the hands of the individuals and the families. And so, okay, I have that tool. Who wants to use that tool in their business to be able to then partner and say, here's the lifestyle wellness tool. Go through it. Assess your readiness for change. Identify your goals. Okay, that's a new process for a lot of people. That doesn't take a bunch of us. That doesn't take a bunch of, of people. It takes taking the people and putting the solution in the hands of those people. And so I think collaboration is huge. You know, um, that, uh, collaboration is a wellness value. Competition is a worldly value. And one of the things we have to be careful of is men are more tendency, have a more tendency to be competitive. Women have a more tendency to be collaborative. Let's all be collaborative and partner together. Um, I'm not in Colorado and I'm not gonna go to Colorado, but I got a great tool that might be beneficial. I'm not in Michigan, but I got a great tool that might be beneficial. And so if we're collaborating and connecting and sharing the tools and the solutions that we have and we're spreading those around, we each have a bigger tool belt. And the bigger our tool belt, the more effective we can be at teaching families and individuals to be their own best advocate. And that's what we're missing is for them to be their own best advocate and come and say, this is what I think. Let's jump in versus we spend so much time assessing. And then once we get the assessment, we've spent all of our time in a 45 minute consultation, we've spent four, uh, 35 minutes of it assessing. Well, what if they assessed at home before they ever came and they brought the paperwork with them? And then I got 40 minutes that I can work on treatment planning instead of wasting so much time in assessment. So I was gonna say along those lines, a startup company that I actually did consulting for that came out of the pandemic is called ADOH Scientific. And so they took emojis and put them on a visual analog scale mm -hmm. and it, they tested it from children all the way through geriatrics didn't matter your language or any development and literally you just slide the bar and it's eight different factors of looking at stress, anxiety, loneliness, right. irritability, depression, pain, fatigue, and overall wellness. And within 60 seconds they had this measure that they mm -hmm. could then provide to doctors, to employers, to all these other situations for that exact piece of let's just do a quick pulse, let's do a quick mm -hmm. check of where are we at and where are we seeing change over time. To your point about 
prevention. I love the analogy of the piece of you have the, the bridge and it's broken, and so you have all of us taking people out of the water once they've fallen in. Well, why don't we just fix the planks so they don't fall in the first place? And so looking at what are those aspects, and so from tracking something that's a much shorter amount of time, yes, we have such an importance and a need for diagnostics and for assessment and all those pieces, and I'll be the first one to say that for what I do with well-being, but to have that quick touch point mm -hmm. where it's just to check in. For a lot of people, they don't even realize. You, know, you walk into the smoky bar after a few minutes, you don't even sense the smoke anymore because you've acclimated to it. How many people have been just existing in that constant state of stress and of anxiety? And okay, we see the average person adding an extra hour each day to their work day because they're going from meeting to meeting and now we gotta clean out the inbox to try to function. And now I wanna be a parent and I wanna co-teach and all these other things. But we haven't stopped to even do that 30 second check-in for ourselves of how am I doing? And so whether you're using these different pieces just for that quick touch point, then we can proactively jump in when we see something starting to change before it gets to that reactive side where it's already the problem. We do need to normalize self-care. I 100% right. agree. And we have right. all of these social media apps that track how much fun we're having. And we have all these watches that show how much calories we burned. Why can't we normalize? Your emoji today, how do you feel today? And I think that would bring attention to the people who realize that trend that, I mean, applied behavior analysis is all about data collection, data collection. So if we see that trend emerging, then we should normalize that self-care and the asking for help. Self-care isn't selfish. Well, so. and we can use the pandemic as a tool for this. I mean, the pandemic mm -hmm. doesn't always have to be negative. We can actually take this and spin it. You know, emotionally, it's affected Everybody, admit it. Everybody has had a mental health issue after the pandemic. So let's make it normal. Let's kind of try to use it to end the stigma a little bit. Let's use it to make mental health communication a conversation with everybody. It doesn't have to be a stigma that's going to get in the way of career, or get in the way of your schooling, or get in the way of, of advancement in any way, shape, or form. It can be a normal conversation, and it starts with healthcare providers, it starts with employers, it starts with checking in with yourself. It has to be a normal conversation. We have our last question. We've been given the nod. So here's the last question. Which mental health issue will cause the greatest fallout if we ignore it? I think all of us will say mine. <laughs> Everybody's. Everybody individually has their own, you know, the, the mental, from an addiction standpoint, um, the fallout, the reactivity is, um, is definitely exacerbated. We all work with it, but that's the end game. You know, the, the addiction is a manifestation of the mental health decline that's actually been happening. So, you know, it's too late when it gets to me. You know, we need to have an earlier response. I think the correct answer for all of us is denial. Denial is the biggest issue. I don't have a problem. I don't need help, whether it's addiction or mental health or parenting or the stress, being in a corporate environment or stay-at-home mom. That denial, that, un that lack of acceptance that something bad is happening and something needs to be fixed triggers everything else to just slide down. Yeah. And understanding that we are multidimensional beings. Mental health is not a silo, emotional health is not a silo, and eating and physical health is not a silo. When you bring up about the watch trackers and whatever, that's exactly right. We focus so much on physical well-being at the expense of understanding how emotional and mental well-being fill into that. I can't manage diabetes if I'm stressed. And if I can't identify where my stress come from, my blood pressure is never gonna be maintained. And giving me more medication is just circling a loop. So it, it doesn't solve the problem. Helping people become well and healthy requires solutions that are multidimensional to address multidimensional people. Yeah, and I, I would say if I had to maybe say one word, my word would be stress, because I think stress is something that everybody can relate to, and when stress goes unaddressed, it leads to anxiety and depression, and so if we can kind of start there, and we look at that spectrum starting from stress on one end of the spectrum, and then going to the other end of the different mental health issues, that's a, a really great place to start. 
just to toggle on that, obviously from a sleep standpoint as well, I think that there's so much of that healing and that restoration that happens, but when we're stressed, we're not getting that. Mm -hmm. When we're not sleeping well, we end up using because we're trying to shut our brain off or we're trying to get that rest or we're not sleeping well, what it puts on our, our physical pieces and we know that it just affects all these different aspects. So I think it all ties in together of stress to the physical to all the other aspects. I think that if we are truly foundations of healthcare, then we are in agreement that it is the ounce of prevention that is required. Pounds of cure are expensive, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. You know what's free? Sleeping, eating well, moving your body, hydrating your body, and breathing on purpose. Those are foundations to get underneath whatever's going on mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially that is really gonna help heal. I wanna thank my panel of brilliant goddesses for enlightening all of us, and thank you very much for attending this session with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good job.